The world is full of radio noise, random frequencies and waves. As more devices go wireless, it only adds to the cacophony of noises. So the big challenge for a mobile device is how to receive the right signals without interference. Think about it, just how amazing it is that your cell phone can receive the right signals from a far away tower out of sight. It's amazing. And the radio frequency or RF filter inside your mobile's radio plays a critical role in pulling it off without a hitch. Prior to 2007, the RF filter industry was sleepy and did not attract much attention. Then Steve Jobs announced the iPhone and that forever changed the RF filter. In this video, we talk about a subject perhaps a bit niche, but nevertheless vital, radio filters. Basically put, the radio filter does a simple job. It is a circuit device that receives an input signal and creates an output based on that input signal's frequency. If the input frequency is within a certain desired frequency range, then that output needs to be similar to its original input, which is a pass, the pass band. Ideally, it should be identical, but the output can't be identical due to a small, impossible to avoid reduction, which we call insertion loss. Insertion loss cannot be avoided, but we do want it to be as low as possible because it means signal degradation. If the output is outside the desired range, then the output is zero. Practically, it can't be zero, but we want it to get as low as possible. Chart this whole thing out, and you get something that kind of looks like a woman's skirt or a mesa. So in the industry, what they call a steep, quote, filter skirt, end quote, means that the filter lets through a lot of the right bands and rejects the unwanted ones. The industry uses a single dimensionless number to measure how good an RF filter is, band pass quality factor, or Q. There are other types of Q out there, but this is one for band pass filters. Q is defined as the ratio of the center frequency, in other words, the middle of the skirt, to the low to high end of its frequency range, in other words, the width of the skirt, or bandwidth. So center frequency divided by bandwidth. The higher the Q, the better. The lower the insertion loss, the better. Filters exist for all sorts of waves. When we talk about RF filters, we're referring to those with a frequency band between 100 MHz and 10 GHz. Anything higher than that, we're probably talking about microwave filters. So that is what the RF filter is supposed to do. How does it go about doing that job? There are many devices, but the RF filters inside our modern smartphones are SAW and BAW filters. They dominate the market. Let me first start with SAW. The concepts behind the SAW radio filter date back to the 1880s and Lord Rayla himself. In 1885, Rayla predicted and then created a mathematical formula for what we now call Rayla waves, a subtype of what we call surface acoustic waves, or SAW. These are waves traveling across the surface of a solid. Seismic waves are another form of surface acoustic waves. Cool, right? And in fact, that is the line of research the surface acoustic wave community took for the next 20 years or so. Then came World War II, which greatly heightened the work done in the SAW field. Radars work by sending out radio waves and reading what comes back. To get the best reading, we needed good radio filters to increase our signal-to-noise ratio. Then in 1965, a UC Berkeley professor, Richard White, and his graduate student F.W. Voltmer demonstrated an interesting effect with the surface waves using special comb-shaped metallic electrodes called interdigitated transducers, or IDTs. The phrase interdigitated refers to the electrodes' arrangement, which resembles two interlocked hands. They then put two similar, if not structurally identical, IDTs on top of a bar of crystalline quartz. The quartz bar acts as a piezoelectric substrate. Piezoelectric referring to the conversion of electrical and mechanical energy. It has a critical role to play, which will matter later. When the first IDT, an input IDT, receives a radio signal that is within the desired frequency band, it will convert that radio signal into mechanical energy. That mechanical energy manifests as a unique surface acoustic wave 
traveling outwards from the IDT across the surface of the quartz bar. The wave then hits another IDT terminal, often called the output IDT, and it turns the wave into an electrical signal via the piezoelectric effect. This electrical signal can now enter the chipset to be interpreted. Some devices add what are called reflectors to both sides of the IDT. The waves will reflect back and forth between those reflectors trapped inside the filter like, and spoilers for a 20-year-old movie, that guy at the end of the first Saw movie. Game over. Such devices are called surface acoustic wave resonators. We should take some time to discuss how these systems are fabricated. These are MEMS devices, RF MEMS to be precise. MEMS stands for Microelectromechanical Devices, and their design has tiny electro and mechanical devices whose production requires semiconductor technology. The filter's effective frequency range is dependent on the distance of the gaps between the IDT electrodes' teeth, or comb fingers. In the 1980s, that gap was as small as 300 nanometers. So we used deposition to deposit a thin film layer of metal, usually some aluminum alloy, on top of a piezoelectric substrate. That substrate is usually the aforementioned quartz crystal or lithium niobate for higher frequencies. After that, we used lithography to pattern the filter's features onto that metal layer. Usually that includes the IDT, resonators, and all that. Then we etch it. Having all the action take place on the filter's surface makes the SAW filter easier to manufacture. With early SAW filters, you only needed to deposit, pattern, and etch one layer. More advanced SAW filters might get more complicated, but on the whole, don't add that many more layers. One manufacturing downside, though, is that it does mean we need to be a bit more careful with regards to packaging. We often sealed these into vacuums, which was challenging. Okay, back to the history. After publication, Professor White and Voltmer apparently moved on from their work, unaware of its applications, which were apparently limited at the time. But later, the SAW filter caught the industry's interest because it was a good, small analog filter that worked on frequencies from 10 MHz to 1 GHz and beyond. The military were some of the first people to research these, trying to improve their communication systems. In situations where interference can be accidentally or not accidentally be injected into the airwaves, good signal-to-noise ratios are critical. An SAW filter was used on the Voyager missions in the late 1970s. Tested for extreme environmental conditions, the filter has worked for nearly 50 years. The Voyager seems to be going through some recent issues. Then in 1975, TV companies like Philips, Plessy, and Siemens found that SAW filters were good, low-cost replacements for the old coil and capacitor-based filters in their TV sets. Better filters meant being able to tune in to more TV channels without static interference, something that used to be a problem back before Netflix and YouTube and all that. Quickly after approving the use case, these TV companies started making 30 to 40 million of these units. It was one of the first big RF MEMS products. Motorola demonstrated the first wireless mobile phone in 1973 the Dynatac. The Dynatac used ceramic filters for their RF filtering needs, and while those ceramics were smaller than the aforementioned coil and capacitor filters, they still took up a large portion of the system. So as standards for 2G cellular communication systems developed throughout the 1980s, they looked for something smaller. Then in 1992, Fujitsu fabricated the first SAW resonator-based RF filters for mobiles. They were small, cheap, and easy to make, as we mentioned above. Even back in 1975, SAW filters were estimated to cost like 2 bucks each. Nearly 15 years later, each filter cost between $1.40 and $1.60 when bought in volumes of 50 million units. You can fill a bucket with these filters for more than what the bucket cost. That is kind of remarkable, though I feel empathy for the poor MEMS fab. So the SAW dominated the market at the start, but as the 2G GSM standard developed, the SAW's limitations got more clear. It got challenging to produce SAW filters for frequencies above 2 GHz. That is because as the filter's center frequency gets higher, you must make the distance between the teeth smaller. Above 2 GHz, the distances are too small to easily produce. G 
GSM started off with just one RF band. So such a GSM handset only needed two RF filters, one to send and one to receive. But then GSM started to add more bands, so we needed to add more filters, and then those filters started to interfere with one another. So as we got towards 3G at the turn of the century, people recognized the need for something new. In 1998, a team at the German semiconductor maker Infineon began working on an alternative, the Bulk Acoustive Wave Filter, or BAW. I want to call them Ba like Ma and Pa, but I will hold back. The concepts of the BAW filter date back to 1980. BAW filters work very similar to the SAW filters. We turn RF energy into mechanical energy, which we can then turn into a signal. However, the BAW filter directs the energy throughout its entirety, its bulk, rather than just along the surface. Such waves not only travel faster, but can also travel farther without deterioration. There are two major subtypes of BAW filters. The first is the Film Bulk Acoustic Resonator, or FBAR. The other is the Solidly Mounted Resonator, or SMR. Fundamentally, they work the same. At their core is a capacitor-ish structure consisting of the top and bottom electrodes sandwiching the layer of piezoelectric material, like quartz crystal. When an RF signal hits the electrodes, they make electric fields would then cause the piezoelectric to generate acoustic waves. The waves travel between those electrodes vertically, up and down, through the piezoelectric material. We can then convert those into an electric signal. The center frequency is determined by the thickness of the piezoelectric layer. The layer can often get very thin. A crystal for 10 MHz is about 170 micrometers thick, with tolerances equally as demanding. When it comes to FBAR and SMR, there are some differences. You can make SMR using traditional VLSI technology, for instance. But the key difference between the SMR and the FBAR regards how they trap and contain the acoustic energy within the sandwich. This is a delicate sandwich. Any interference will cause energy to leak from the sandwich, degrading the acoustic waves bouncing between the electrodes and thus causing serious performance degradation. So we need some way to isolate it, kind of like how a semiconductor fab suspends its clean room to prevent ground vibrations from interfering with work. The F-bar does this by suspending the sandwich in midair. Yes, the F-bar has a literal air gap inside it. This is produced using a MEMS technique, a sacrificial layer deposited onto the silicon substrate that you can later etch away using acid gas. There are several types of F-bars. Some F-bars have a thin membrane stretched over the air gap, kind of like a memory foam pad for your mattress, or they have springs or vias at the edges. On the other hand, the SMR solidly grounds the whole structure, but then adds a set of acoustic reflectors, Bragg reflectors like the stuff we have for EUV lithography machines to reflect the acoustic waves back up to the sandwich. While SMRs are very interesting, they are generally not as performant as S-bars at high frequencies, so our journey will continue on with the F-bar. Beyond their suitability for higher frequencies, F-bar filters hold many intrinsic benefits over SAW filters. For instance, the capacitor-like structure mean better containment of the electrical fields, preventing electrical crosstalk between filters. And they're less sensitive to contamination from surface particles landing on the filter, that was a real problem for SAW filters. But there was one big downside. They're harder to make. We still produce these F-bars using advanced MEMS technology. What do you expect, elves? But F-bars have far more complicated structures than SAW filters. The piezoelectric layer is often made from either aluminum nitride or zinc oxide and must be very thin. And depending on the substance, it might be difficult to produce a good, even layer. The complexity of the F-bar design manifests itself in the increased number of mask layers. You can make a very simple BAW filter with a single mask layer, but it won't work well. An SAW filter takes one, maybe two to three mask layers tops, but a good F-bar filter will take nine to 13 plus mask layers. HP Labs began researching F-bars in 1993. HP spun off the labs to create a new company called Agilent. 
and it was Agilent that first began shipping commercial duplexers, a device for bi-directional radio comms with F-bar filters based on an aluminum nitride sandwich structure. Then in 2006, KKR and Silver Lake bought Agilent's semiconductor business in a deal that I don't think can happen today. That business was renamed to be Avago. Avago later went public and then bought Infineon's F-Bar Research Group in 2008 for about $20 million. Today, Avago is now Broadcom, which they bought in 2015. I covered them in a prior video back when they tried to buy Qualcomm. Now we can finally talk iPhone. When the iPhone first hit the market, it was originally just the phone. The original iPhone released in 2007 had a 2G radio. Its quad-band GSM Edge RF transceiver, produced by, I think, Infineon, used SAW filters. Its successor, the iPhone 3G from 2008, moved up to 3G GSM, and it used SAW filters as well. iFixit's teardown article back then mused on whether the filters came from the Japanese company Murata. This continued to be the case with the iPhones 4 and 4S. The iPhone 4's SAW filters were manufactured by Skyworks. I dug up a Skyworks datasheet confirming that its front-end module is dual-band equipped with SAW filters. And as for the iPhone 4S, I think those SAW filters came from the American semiconductor company Triquint, which is now Corvo, after they did a big merger with RF Micro Devices in 2015. I want to note that I'm not entirely sure about their names. This video is about filters specifically, not RF modems on the whole. Feel free to send me an email to correct. Anyway, my point is that these were phones, and they had RF filters befitting a phone. But then came the App Store, and suddenly people realized that their iPhone was more than just a phone, but rather an entire little internet-enabled computer right in their pocket. It set off this monstrous explosion of demand for mobile data. Then in 2011, Apple released the iPhone 5, and as Apple likes to say in their marketing, everything was different all over again. The iPhone 5 was the first iPhone to use the LTE wireless standard. The name stands for long-term evolution, whatever that means, but it offers better data bandwidth, lower latency, and unlike 2G or 3G, is IP-based. LTE covers a staggering 40 frequency bands around the world ranging from 600 MHz to 3600 MHz. So LTE phones must have filters for all those bands. That means a lot of filters and modules. According to the iFixit iPhone 5 teardown, Triquint slash Corvo duplexers handled stuff for the UMTS band, and an Avago duplexer with an F-bar filter handled LTE. Stuffing so many filters into the phone makes it more expensive to produce. However, by the time the iPhone 5 came around, Apple was battling for market share. To achieve the most scale, Apple wanted to produce a single, quote, world phone for every country around the world. There was a customer element as well. Jobs wanted the iPhone to have the best customer experience. Nobody wants to travel to Europe or Taiwan or wherever for a vacation, only to find out that their iPhone won't work with the local LTE band. The result is a massive explosion in mobile radio capability. The original iPhone had just a quad band radio. What a loser. Less than a decade later, the iPhone 7 can access 23 or 24 GSM CDMA and LTE bands. The Samsung Galaxy phones can do 16, and that is not including Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth, and NFC. In 2004, the BAW RF filter business was worth less than $100 million. But the iPhone 5 release and the LTE rollout supercharged the industry's fortunes. By 2016, the high-band RF filter industry was estimated to be worth over $1.6 billion. New market pressures emerged. People want their mobile devices to not only be thinner and lighter, but also more performant, pressuring RF front-end suppliers to integrate separate filters, switches, and power amplifiers into single RF units. And I should note that these BAW filters now look like mineral formations. They do not look like what you imagine a normal silicon chip would, which testifies to the diversity of the semiconductor ecosystem. The BAW RF filter industry itself has largely consolidated into two major players, Corvo and Avago slash Broadcom. Together, they control about 95% of the market. And interestingly enough, Broadcom fabs their RF filters in the United States. I believe it is Fort Collins, Colorado. The Denver Post says that there are about 1,100 Americans working there. 
The SAW devices market still has a number of different players, with some of the larger ones including Murata, Skyworks, Corvo, and the Japanese company Taiyo Yuden, not to mention all the many dozens of small vendors. LTE was a 4G technology and drove a huge boom, and now we are going into a 5G world. 5G can deliver significantly faster data rates than 4G devices, which in turn demands not only higher frequencies, but also larger slices of those higher frequencies. So BAW filters need to adapt once again. An RF filter for a higher frequency needs to make the electrode piezoelectric sandwich even thinner, and the materials might even have to change. One major concern has been the piezoelectric material used in the sandwich. For a long time, that standard has been aluminum nitride, but the demand for bigger bandwidths has led companies to start doping scandium into the mix, which improves the RF performance. The catch, though, is that doping in scandium has manufacturing issues, leaving the guys at Corvo and Broadcom to play a fun game of trying to figure out how much scandium they can add in and get away with. I want to thank viewer and friend of the channel Josh for suggesting this topic and also for patiently walking me through the details. The iPhone 5 and the LTE boom drove a massive investment in RF filters, creating a multi-billion dollar industry almost overnight. The big question is whether that boom will continue. In 2019, the Wall Street Journal reported that Broadcom, the OG RF filter company, put their RF business unit up for sale for $10 billion. They ended up not selling, but friend of the show, Jay Goldberg, wrote at his blog, Digits to Dollars, that it was a sign. A sign that they believe that 5G is not going to be the same bonanza that 4G and LTE was. There will always be demands for new frequencies, more integration, smaller sizes, better heat, and less power. But the iPhone 15 Pro now supports something like 40 bands today in LTE and 5G. So for issues of sheer manufacturability and declining returns, I do find the argument compelling that the insane growth days of the early 2010s are pretty much over. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.